2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 18. Now, if the ministry that brought death, chiseled in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For, what it, uh, for if what was set aside was glorious, what endures will be even more glorious. Since then, we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains. It is not lifted, because it is set aside only in Christ. Yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks for praying. Every father has hopes for their children. Uh, hopes such as that they live happy, productive lives, that if they marry, they might marry a godly spouse and be blessed with children. But when all is said and done, the prayer every godly father pleads with God is, Lord, please save my children. I've shared the way of salvation, but only you can make it live in their hearts. Please do that. So with that in mind, I want to talk to you about six fathers. And I want you to imagine what each of these six fathers might have told their children about the way of salvation. Well, the first dad is Adam. Kids, we blew it. Man, I blew it in the garden. I ruined it for everybody. But you've walked in my footsteps. I mean, Cain, you killed your brother. But God's grace is greater than our sin. Our God promised a seed who'll crush the serpent. Trust that God will send that seed and you will live. Second one's Noah. Kids, we blew it. Our whole world blew it. Evil ran rampant, so God destroyed this world in the flood. But you know what? Even after the flood, I blew it again. I got drunk and ham. Boy, did you blow it. You dishonored me. But God's grace is greater than our sin. And he's made this covenant that he's not going to destroy this world by a flood again because the seed he promised to Adam is yet to come. God has been so gracious to spare us. The seed will come through us. But you've got to trust that. Trust that God will send that seed and you will live. Third one is Abraham. Kid, we blew it. Wow, Babel shows how much we blew it. And I mean, look at me, I was a moon worshipper, I lied about my wife, I tried to bear the son of promise through my slave, and Isaac, I've watched you, you're walking right in my footsteps. But God's grace is greater than our sin. He promised a seed, and now he's chosen me and you and our descendants as the ones the seed will come through. Trust that God will send that seed and you will live. Fourth one is Moses. Kids, we blew it. I was becoming so proud and so wooed by Egypt. I blew it in anger. I failed to trust God. And God graciously gave us his law. And how did we thank him? We made a golden calf and wine. But God's grace is greater than our sin. The law became a teacher that shows us our need of a saviour. It points to the one of promise, the seed promised to Adam and Abraham. And we do see shadows of this one in the sacrifices, the priests and the tabernacle, but trust that God will send the seed and you'll live. Fifth one, David. Kids, we blew it. Man, I blew it so many times. Bathsheba, Uriah, numbering the nation, and now you've blown it. I mean, Absalom, you instigated a coup against me. Our nation has blown it. I am so deeply ashamed. 
But God's grace is greater than our sin. He promised a kingdom that will never end because he's going to send an eternal king. That king is the seed promised to Adam and to Abraham. So trust that God will send that seed and you'll live. I hope you hear that basically the message of each one of them is the same. Trust that God will send that seed and you'll live. Now, each one of them knew a bit more about that seed, but even for the latter ones like Moses and David, the seed remained veiled in shadows and mystery. You know what? Some of their children, some of their descendants believed. Most did not. Sixth father I want to talk about is Murray Hudson. (laughs) Muzz has a different message. Abby... Penny, Willow, Eddie, kids, we blew it. I messed up, mum messed up, you guys have messed up. But God's grace is greater than our sin. God promised a seed and here's the great thing, he has come. In the fullness of time, God kept his promise. Jesus, God's own son, came, he lived a perfect life and we see the full glory of the Father in him at the cross. He died as a substitute for us. We can place our faith in him. Death could not hold him. In him we live. Trust that God has sent his seed and you'll live. Now, which of those men do you want as your dad? Now, I know we all want Muzz as our dad. (laughs) But I want to tell you there's probably a greater reason you should want Muzz as your dad. Is the message of salvation he can give to us is so much greater than the message to Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, or David. You see, promise and shadow and mystery are now blazing reality. We don't get to just say, hey, this vague shadowy seed will come. We get to say, look at the cross. Christ has come. Trust, believe, and live. Hallelujah. You see, Murray's new covenant ministry, your new covenant ministry, it's so much greater than any man or woman who lived before the cross. Murray can preach, you can preach, and see the dead come to life spiritually in Christ. Now, it's not that there's any power in us. It is the gospel of the new covenant energized by the power of the Holy Spirit that brings the spiritually dead to life. And that is a mark of new covenant ministry. Now, we're working our way through the book of 2 Corinthians. I remind you, Paul wrote this book because this group of self-styled super apostles turned up in Corinth and they twisted this, uh, preached this twisted, man-centered gospel. And they sought to discredit the ministry of Paul. And 2 Corinthians is Paul's defense of his ministry. I titled this whole series, Crucified Leadership. And I told you, I want to sum up the whole book this way. A saint with character shaped through adversity is a saint God can use. A saint with character shaped through adversity. Now, that is a saint that God can use. And Paul then gives this long series of marks of crucified leadership. We've got a crucified saviour, so the people who lead the church have to have these marks of crucified leadership. Last week, we looked at the fourth mark, death, This week's mark is intimately related to it, life. Last week, Paul said, when you look at a leader, they've got to have died to self and they've got to have this aroma of death. This morning, what we're going to see is this. We, you and I, have the greatest of privileges to proclaim the Son has come, so behold his glory and live. We have the greatest of privileges. We get to proclaim that the Son has come has come so you can behold his glory and live. Now, why is Paul doing this? The ministry of the super apostles was tainted. They compromised the gospel and the result was their ministry did not bring life. In that respect, their ministry was much more old covenant than new covenant. And Paul says, one of the marks of a new covenant minister is life. We preach and this church came into existence, he says. And he makes it clear in two points. First, our new covenant ministry is greater because we proclaim the unfading glory of the Son. 
I want to read all of verses 7 to 11. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 11. Now, if the ministry that brought death, chiseled in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was set aside was glorious, what endures will be even more glorious. Paul wants us to know how much greater the new covenant ministry is than old covenant ministry. Now, when you read verses like verse 6, the letter kills, verse 7, the ministry of the old covenant brings death, verse 9, this ministry brings condemnation, you read that and you think, wow, Paul is not a fan of the old covenant. Well, that's not entirely true. When you read it, what is much more accurate to say is Paul is not a fan of the old covenant, the law, as a means to salvation. The old covenant was never meant to be a way to save. It showed we needed saving. It pointed to the one who could save through its symbols and shadows. Its sacrifices did cover sin until Christ came, but it itself could not save. Now, having said that, I do need to detour for a moment. Why? Because many of you will have been raised or at least exposed to a theological system that does teach you can be saved through the old covenant. So what Paul says may confuse those raised in that system, so I do want to address it briefly. The system I'm talking about is classic covenant theology. Here's how it understands the relationship between the testaments. Uh, now, I will point out, while I disagree with it, I want to be very clear, this is a very good system of theology. It orders the covenants and the story of God's redemption and puts it all together by saying there's one overarching covenant, the covenant of grace, and they teach it has two administrations, the old and the new covenants. And because the old and new are just two parts of this one main covenant, not a huge difference between them. It's almost as if the old covenant seamlessly blends into the new covenant. For example, the Westminster Confession of Faith says this, there are not therefore two covenants of grace differing in substance, but one and the same under various dispensations. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying the old covenant and the new covenant are just different ways that God provided his plan of salvation. The confession also says this, the covenant was for that time sufficient and efficacious by whom they had full remission of sins and eternal salvation. By ordering the covenants that way, it of necessity teaches the old covenant was sufficient and it was efficacious and it saved. Now, you can see the difficulty with this morning's passage. So the way theologians, like those who hold to the Westminster Confession, get around this is they give a very broad definition to the term Old Covenant. Classic covenant theology views the Old Covenant uh, and the whole Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, as basically being the same thing. When you see Old Covenant, they say it refers not just to the Mosaic Covenant, the law, but the whole Old Testament, and all of these covenants, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, they're, they're all part of it. Now, others of you have grown up in other theological systems, and I will say that most, not all, but most other theological systems view the Old Covenant as only referring to the Mosaic Covenant or the Mosaic Law. I'll also tell you classic covenant theologians admit broadening the covenant out that way, it flows from their theology, not directly from any text. I'm in the second group here, and I would argue that the Bible is very clear. When you see Old Covenant or First Covenant, it means the Mosaic Covenant or the Mosaic Law. And in our passage, Paul does seem to use it that way. Tablets of stone, ministry of Moses, Old Covenant, they're synonyms. That's interesting. If you've been around churches, theologians, pastors, you hear New Covenant, Old Covenant used an awful lot. In actual fact, verse 14 in our passage is the only place in the Bible that uses the term 
Old Covenant. Nowhere else is it called an Old Covenant. It's not called that way in the Old Testament because the Old Covenant only becomes old when the new comes. Now, Jeremiah does say a new one's coming that'll make it obsolete. The writer of Hebrews continually calls it the first covenant. But clearly, he means the same thing as Paul, old covenant. Uh, Hebrews is pretty clear. Hebrews 8, Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second one. See, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant, not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Especially verse 13. By saying a new covenant, he's declared the first is obsolete, and what is obsolete and growing old is about to pass away. And then he goes and explains that. It's an old covenant only because the new has come. Paul and the writer of Hebrews specifically contrast new covenant with the mosaic, the old, the covenant given on Sinai after God led them by the hand out of Egypt. Nowhere in the Bible do you find a contrast saying the whole Old Testament is made obsolete by the new covenant. It's only this covenant with Moses and only as a way to righteousness that fades away and becomes obsolete. Crucially, covenants with Noah, Abraham and David are clearly not obsolete and have not passed away. It's a theological decision to make the old covenant mean more than the covenant with Moses. So you're probably like, well, how do we understand the covenants? Man, that's long, complex. I'm going to give you the one-minute version of where I'm at. Um, If you need to know, I hold to what's called progressive covenantalism. Uh, I think it allows the text to speak for itself well. And instead of having the guiding principle that Scripture is structured around as a covenant of grace, it structures around a promise of God to save, made in eternity past, given in the garden, and unchanging. All of the covenants in the Old Testament are built on this promise of a seed who will come and save. And each one adds a bit more detail, but none uh, changes the basis of salvation. It is the same throughout. Notably, the covenant to Abraham makes the promise of salvation by faith explicit to Israel. Some places like Romans 4, Paul's very clear. Salvation for Abraham is by faith, same as us. And he says, and you know what? His salvation came before the covenant given to him. In fact, it came before he was circumcised because it's based not on the covenant, but by the promise in the garden. So Abraham is saved the same way you and I are and everybody is saved, by faith alone, based on the promise of God. But clearly all of these covenants had shadows and they had pictures and they pointed to the one who will come. Uh, Noah had pictures like the blood sacrifice, Abraham had land, seed, blessing, Moses had the law, David had the kingdom. But the point is, finally the reality comes in Christ and we get the new covenant. But the Mosaic covenant the law as a way to righteousness, it's eclipsed by Christ. And so when the reality came, that covenant became obsolete. Now, don't don't get me wrong. We still learn from the law. We still learn about the standard of God and the righteousness of God, but we now do it through the lens of Christ. Now, I know that's really complex and that probably needs 10 sermons to unpack, but the point is, Paul's saying... The old covenant was never meant to be a way of salvation, so the new covenant, which is, is infinitely greater. So let me get back to what we need to look at this morning. Why is this important for us? Well, if you understand the old covenant and new covenant to be both ways of salvation, you you can miss the point Paul's making. Paul is saying the old covenant can't save, the new one can And therefore, it is so much greater. And he does this by taking a very interesting facet of Moses' ministry and unpacking it. He said, the covenant that Moses got, it had partial glory and even that bit faded away. It had some glory, but not saving glory. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now again, don't think the law had no grace. It was a gracious gift. 
It did help them know they need a saviour and point to the saviour, but it's not a saving grace. It's Christ and his covenant that saves. Think about it this way. What, what did Moses get to preach? Well, we know. Deuteronomy 5.1. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Israel, listen to the statutes and ordinances I'm proclaiming as you hear them today. Learn and follow them carefully. Moses is given a covenant of law. He then reminds him about the law by giving the Ten Commandments and his message was, Israel, listen to the law and keep the law. Now, we know no one could keep the law. Galatians 2.21, if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The law could not save. It showed you can't save yourself, you need a saviour. Now, that they could be saved, but it's not by the law. They had the promise given in the garden, reiterated in Abraham, they had that covenant and that's how they were saved, not through the law. What did the law do? It told us we've got to be holy. Leviticus 11.45, For I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God, so you must be holy because I'm holy. The law said, this is what holiness is. You keep it and be holy. And no one could do it. So we need something greater than the law to save. Now, in a sense, the old covenant builds on the promise to Adam, to Abraham. It shows us this promise in things like uh, pictures of sacrifices and priests, temples. It tells us someone will have to shed blood. They'll have to be a mediator. And Paul's clear, the old covenant can't do this, but it points to one who can. So his summary, in the final verse we looked at last time, verse 6, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What he's saying is the old covenant wasn't designed to save, it was designed to point, and point to a saviour. And when the Saviour came, it became obsolete. When the substance, the reality came, when the one who would pay for our sins in his blood arrived, the old faded away. So let me summarise the different kinds of ministry that these two men had. Moses, he's not sent to preach to everybody, just to Israel. The law was for them. God didn't tell Moses, here's the promised land and it's filled with all these pagans. How are you going to conquer it? You go in there preaching and convert them all. No. And even if Moses could go to the Philistines, what would his message be? Hey, you all need to get circumcised, you all need to join Israel and you all need to submit to the law. Oh, and by the way, none of you will keep the law. So you're going to have to believe in the seed and then you can be saved. Paul preached not just to Jews but to Gentiles, the Gospels for all nations. At best, Moses could say, you need a saviour, but Paul could say, the saviour's come. He could point to the cross and say, hallelujah. So what's the result? Under Moses and the prophets, most in Israel rejected God, most hardened their hearts. They failed to keep the law, they turned to idols, they wanted other gods. The outcome is only a tiny remnant within Israel were saved. But under the new covenant, the Spirit's poured out on everyone, every last one in the church is saved. So one becomes a ministry of death, one becomes a ministry of life. One has partial glory and even that glory is designed to fade, one has full glory that will never fade. Augustine summed up these two covenants this way. The new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. Now, if I've totally confused you, okay, let me summarise. The new covenant, which is the one you and I live under because we're on this side of the cross, is exponentially greater than the old one because Jesus has come and because he has come, that covenant can save, it can bring life. So Paul sums up why the new covenant's greater in these two points. First, we get to proclaim the unfading glory of the sun. So all of these shadows, all of these types, all of these vague illusions are gone, replaced by the unfading, blazing glory of Christ. In the law, they had glimpses of the one to come. They had vague shadows, sacrifices, priests, temples. 
It's designed to fade when the reality comes. Now, Paul shows us this through a really interesting part of Moses' ministry. Let me remind you about Exodus 32 to 34. So Moses goes up on Mount Sinai. He receives the law. He's there longer than Israel. We're expecting. They're getting worried. Oh, we're in the wilderness. We've got no God. We'll make a God. And they build a golden calf. Moses comes down the mountain, sees this, smashes the tablets of the law, gets in a hump, goes and puts the tent outside the camp, and there he speaks face to face with God. And he goes, I've had it with this people. I don't want to lead them anymore. And God says, nice try. You don't get out of it. You're still going to lead them. And Moses says, okay, but you've got to show me your glory. I beg you. And God says, you can't see my face and live. Now, first you think, what? Because earlier it had said when he's in the tent, he's talking to God face to face. And now God says, you can't see my face and live. And you're like, what's going on? Well, you need to understand face to face, it's a common idiom that's used that just means intimately. It means he spoke to God as one speaks with a friend. It does not mean he saw the face or the glory of God. And so God makes it clear, you cannot see my face, my glory and live. So God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hide you in the crevice of a rock. I'm going to put my hand over you. And when I've passed by, I'll let you have a little bit of a glimpse. But all you're going to see is my back, that little bit of my trailing edge of glory. And he does that. And then God cuts a new set of the Ten Commandments and he sends Moses down the mountain. And then we come to our passage. Exodus 34, 29 to 35. As Moses descended from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, as he descended the mountain, he didn't realise the skin of his face shone as a result of his speaking with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face shone, they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called out to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he commanded them to do everything the Lord had told him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he'd remove the veil until he came out. After he came out, he'd tell the Israelites what had been commanded, and the Israelites would see that Moses' face was radiant. Then Moses put the veil over his face again until he went to speak with the Lord. So Paul says a few things we need to learn from this. First, Moses was only exposed to a fraction of God's glory but it's enough to make his face shine. Notice Moses didn't come down and then preach, hey, the seed's coming, Messiah's coming, trust in that. No, no. His covenant was law. So he said, you keep everything the Lord told us in the law. Now, as well, clearly the law has some glory. The sacrifices, the priesthood, the temple, the festivals, the Sabbath, they're all shadows of Christ, but they do have their own glory because they show us We need a saviour. So why is the law given? Galatians 3.24, Paul says the law was given as a tutor to show us we need a saviour. But here's the thing that Paul draws out of that. He says this glory was designed to be partial, not enough to save, and it was designed to fade to be superseded when the real glory came. What's the real glory? Christ. Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature. Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The shadows and types that could not save are replaced by the reality that can save. When the true light comes, the shadows go. And Paul says, the glory that the true light has, it will never fade. What he means is there's never going to be a newer new covenant. There's never going to be a better way of salvation, that Jesus is good but something is better. No. Here's what Paul's saying. Moses couldn't look at the face of God. All he could see is the back of God. Even that's enough to give his face some glory. Israel didn't even get to see the back of God. All they got to see was the bit of glory that was left on Moses' face. And even that was enough to bring fear 
into them. This fading glory. Now, Paul says what that means is it's a representation of the covenant. The covenant has a partial glory and the covenant is going to disappear. When? Well, John 1.14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the rest of John's Gospel and in 1 John, he says, how do you see Christ? You look to the cross. That's where the full glory of the Son is revealed. And when you look to the cross, you can see the full glory of God in Christ and it will never fade. And you can't compare these two glories. Here's what he's trying to say. Imagine a totally dark night and then into that darkness comes this tiny little light. Someone's in there with a small 12-volt torch with this tiny little bulb and it gives this little bit of light. Now, that is not designed to drive out the darkness, but it is designed to give hope that one day the real light will come. And then in the fullness of time, God says, let there be light, and a blazing sun appears, and it drives out all the darkness, and that sun never fades. And you know what? In the full light, you cannot even see this little bulb. It's gone. Barnett captures the sense well when he says, the glory of the new covenant outglorified and thus deglorified the glory of the old covenant. That's the old covenant, that's the new. Dying bulb, blazing sun. Shadows of the Son of God and the Son come in the flesh. Once all they had was this dim, vague, dark picture, but when Christ came, it came in a full focus and full light. A ministry chiseled on bits of stone that can only condemn is replaced by a ministry of the Spirit on hearts that can actually make righteous. You've got sacrifices of bulls and goats and human priests and demands of the law, all of which cannot save, but when the one they point to who can save comes, the law is ended. So today, you and I get to preach Christ, not law, and that is why our ministry is far more glorious. The old covenant was a fading glory that could only condemn. The new covenant is an unfading glory that can bring righteousness. Brothers and sisters, Moses would have cut off his right arm to have what you have, a gospel that saves. You don't just have shadows. You don't just have law on tablets of stone. You don't just have blood of bulls and goats and imperfect priests and a temple. You get to say, we have Christ. We have the cross. Look to him and be saved. The second reason our new covenant ministry is greater. We behold the unveiled glory of the Son. Look at verse 12. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. Since we have the privilege of proclaiming the unfading glory of Christ, it makes us bold. We can see people saved and they are transformed. Moses couldn't be bold about his ministry. In fact, he veiled his face. Verse 13. We're not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. Look, let's be honest. When you read Exodus 34 and you read about all this veil stuff with Moses, you go, that's a bit weird, isn't it? It does seem strange. And Paul says, well, you've got to understand why Moses did this. And he tells us, Moses veiled his face so Israel would not see the fading of the partial glory. Israel got a fraction of glory, the bit left on Moses' face after he saw the back of the glory of God. And he says it represents the partial glory of the law, the shadows, the sacrifices, priests, temples. But even this minor glory was designed to fade. It was temporary. It was t intended to be superseded by the greater glory. And Moses said he didn't want them to see this fading glory. He didn't want them to know, you know, the shiny new thing you just got, the law? Well, it's a partial glory. It can't even save and, it, uh, save and it's going to fade. But crucially, the veil also represented what was happening to them spiritually. Look at it, verse 14. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains. It's not lifted 
because it's set aside only in Christ. The idea is that the physical veil on Moses' face also showed there was a spiritual veil on Israel's hearts. Israel looked and they could not see the bit of glory left on Moses' face. Israel looked to the law and they couldn't even see the bit of glory that was in there and trust and get saved. Israel heard the law and when they did, they didn't say, ah, I see, shows I can't be saved, shows I need a saviour, there will be a priest, there will be a sacrifice, there will be one to come. That's not what they do. Their hearts are hard and they go, well, that's not going to save me. I need another God. So we'll build a God or we'll find a God among the nations. Notice as well, Moses goes in the tent, takes off the veil. He can understand the truth God's saying. It shows it's a spiritual veil over hearts. So Israel as a whole hardened their hearts. Yes, a remnant of few softened their hearts, but most did not. This is the same truth again and again throughout the Old Testament. You find it said again and again in the prophets. Let me give you some examples. Isaiah, he's sent to preach to Israel and God says, here's what your preaching's going to do. Isaiah 6. They will keep listening but not understand. They'll keep looking but not perceive. You will make the minds of this people dull, deafen their ears, blind their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their minds, turn back and be healed. He says the same thing later. Isaiah 29, he says, This entire vision will be like the words of a sealed document. If it's given to one who can read and he's asked to read it, he'll say, I can't read it because it's sealed. And if the document is given to one who can't read and he's asked to read it, he'll say, I can't read. Here's how Paul puts this together. Romans 11, 7 and 8. Paul says, What then? Israel did not find what it was looking for, in the law, but the elect did find it. The rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear to this day. So Israel looks, and most of their hearts are hardened. God gives them the spirit of stupor and blinds their eyes, clogs up their ears. Only the elect, only this remnant, only this few are enabled to see and understand and come to faith. It's a consistent teaching. Now, I can tell you, I cannot answer why God chose to harden most hearts in Israel. I have a personal suspicion. It is that if most of Israel could be saved by the shadows and the signs under the old covenant, it would detract from the glory of Christ when he did come. But we don't know for certain. The fact that the veil of the hardening is designed only to be lifted when Christ comes, I think that makes this likely. I think the idea is everything is building up to the coming of the sun and nothing that comes before can take away from that glory. All of the preparatory movements of law and prophets cannot have too much greatness or it takes away from the glory of the sun when he comes. Verses 15 and 16. Yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Christ came. But you know what? Israel still looked to the law, not to Christ, and therefore they still had this veil and they couldn't find Christ and salvation. You only get salvation when you look to Christ. The law was not designed to save. But when someone trusts in Christ, the veil is removed, blinded eyes are opened, and they can see the full glory of Christ. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, he says this to say, oh, and by the way, you don't get to remove the veil yourself. You don't have to go, well, I'm smarter than them. I can see Christ in the law. I can understand this. I worked it out. I earned it. No, the Spirit removes it. He opens blinded eyes. And when we have freedom from the veil, we can see Christ. Verse 18. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, depending on what translation you have in front of you, it reads two different ways. One 
word can be translated two ways. It can mean either reflecting as in a mirror or beholding as in a mirror. What's the difference? Look, if it's reflecting, the idea is this. We look on Christ and we are transformed and we become like him and then we radiate that glory out to the world and the world looks at us and unlike Moses who had a veil, our faces are not veiled and so the world can see the glory of Christ in us and become saved and transformed. The idea is sort of we shine Christ's light to the world. That's certainly possible, but I think the second way is the one Paul means. Uh, It's the more common use of this word and I do think it fits the context better. Uh, Paul's moved from... Uh, veiling faces to removing the veil on hearts. The idea is this. Moses never got to look on the face of God. God said, you can't see my face and live. No man can see the full glory of God and live. In fact, even the minor glory on Moses' face terrified the Israelites. But when we're saved, the veil is removed. We have the freedom to gaze on the full glory of God in Christ. And because we are in Christ, we don't die Instead, we're transformed. If you look down at chapter 4, verse 6, what we'll look at next week, we have the full knowledge of God's glory when we look on the face of Jesus Christ. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He's revealed him. We can do something Moses couldn't. We get to see the face of God in Christ. How? Well, It occurs through the Trinity. God sends his spirit who enables us to see Christ and not die. And as we see Christ, we're transformed into his image. This is great. The more you meditate on him, the more you see him, the more you read the word and allow the spirit to work, you are transformed into him. Why is the new covenant greater? Because with unveiled faces, we can behold the full glory of God in the Son. The old covenant showed Christ as a veiled mystery that hardened hearts. The new covenant shows Christ as an unveiled reality that transforms hearts. See, Israel just had the law to teach them about God's holiness. We got Christ in the cross. See, all they had was something chiseled on there saying, do not murder. We got Christ coming and saying, no, you can do better than that. You've got to be greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. Do not even be angry with your brother or sister. They had love your neighbour and hate your enemy. We have love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And the more we behold Christ through his spirit, the more of his glory we see, the more it transforms us and it transforms us from the lesser glory of the law to the greater glory of Christ. And it's not us who do it, it's the spirit. And one day, the unfading, blazing glory of Christ will not just fill the hearts of the church, it will fill all of creation. Revelation 21, 22 and 23. I didn't see a temple in it because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it and its lamp is the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, I am so thankful I live on this side of the cross. Instead of vague shadows and illusions, I can tell my kids, kids, we got the real deal. We got Jesus and him crucified. Instead of saying, you know, there's a serpent on a stick and it kind of somehow points to something that will save us, we can say, look to the cross and see Christ and him crucified and live. So my ministry... And your ministry is so much greater than that of Moses because our message is so much greater. We get to tell the world Christ has come. And when we do, we have the greatest of privileges because of that message and the work of the Spirit, we can see the spiritually dead come to eternal life. Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you for passages like this that remind us What a privilege it is for us to be those who live in this end time, who uh, have come after the cross. And we know Christ, and we know the cross, and we know what all of history was working towards, and now we can proclaim it. And Lord, just as it worked in our hearts 
and we live. Now we can proclaim it and see others live. And as it transforms us, so it can transform them. Oh Lord, let us go forth and share this truth. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I thought about show us Christ, but I've chosen in Christ alone. So why don't we stand and we'll sing this together. a benediction from number 6 24 to 26 may the lord bless you and protect you may the lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you may the lord look with favor on you and give you peace amen <laughs>